Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming along to this English Australia webinar. I'm Sophie O'Keefe, and I'm the Head of Professional Development at English Australia, and I'll be facilitating today's session. Today's webinar is a panel discussion, and I'd like to introduce you once again to our three panellists. So today is part two of the webinars on supporting neurodiverse students in the Ellicott classrooms. So those of you who came last week would have already met Mel and Echo and Luz. Um, but for those who didn't, I'll just reintroduce them. So Dr. Melanie Hayworth is an autistic autism researcher, and she's the founder and head of research of the Australian autistic run charity, Reframing Autism. And this charity aims to disrupt the status quo for the autistic community by providing autistic led research, therapies and education. Our second panelist on the screen is Echo O, and Echo has been involved in the adult education sector for almost two decades, including as an Ellicost teacher, which is how I met Echo. And she holds multiple roles currently at Hornsby Karingai Community College for neurodiverse students. Welcome, Echo. And our third panellist is Luz Rengifo Ed. And Luz is an autistic and neurodivergent advocate. And she currently works as an educator as part of the diverse learning team at a high school in Sydney. So thanks for joining us again today, our panellists. All right. So last week in the session, we covered the first four questions in the boxes that you can see on the screen. So we talked about what neurodivergence is and how we can recognize neurodivergent students in our classroom, as well as some of the challenges and strengths that these students bring to the classroom. So today we're gonna to be delving a little bit more deeply into an Ellicost classroom. And we'll talk about strategies to support the success and well-being of neurodivergent students in our classroom. And then we're going to talk about some examples of how Ellicost class activities can be adjusted to be more inclusive. All right, so I think we'll get started with our questions now, panellists. So, Mel, I'd like to ask the first question to you. Um, sometimes in our classrooms, teachers, uh, when they're teaching, they suspect that they may have a student who's neurodivergent in their classroom, um, but uh, this student a lot of the time may not have disclosed their identity. Um, what would you recommend for teachers in this situation? Would you recommend that they talk to the student? How would you deal with this situation if you were in an Ellicost classroom? So I think the first thing we need to say is that, you know, as we have lots of professional expertise, but um, I'm presuming that none of you are diagnosticians. And, and so the fact that you might suspect that someone is neurodivergent doesn't necessarily mean that either they understand that about themselves or um, that it's appropriate for you to kind of um, do that art chair diagnosing of you know well I can see all of these things and maybe that's kind of you know um, for many many people that will be very confronting um, and it's worth noting that although we have um, talked last week a lot about you know taking a really strength-based approach to neurodivergence and neuroaffirmation and trying to meet people's needs and um, and, and take those needs as, you know, both legitimate, but also bringing strengths to the classroom. Um, that's not so in every um, culture around the world. And it's certainly um, the understanding, say, of particular um, neurodivergences like autism and ADHD are very, very different in different cultures. And so when you have a student who come, who is not from an Australian background, um, there is no guarantee that the culture that they come from will be as affirming as we would like to project in our own practice. Um, and so it could be anything from something that you would want to hide and, you know, um, that there, there would be a great deal of shame associated with that um, to something that, you know, um, you know, people may have experienced discrimination, extreme discrimination in the past. So, and there is could be quite a lot of trauma around that. So this is a path that's quite, um, I think, murky to try and tread. So my, my advice is no, 
um, don't talk to your student about it. Um, what you can talk to your student about is um, what they need to be to feel supported, um, what they what what their needs are, what their unique needs are, because every student has unique needs, whether they're neurodivergent or not. Um, so you know, and making that general practice in your classroom to understand what each student's each individual's unique needs are, um, so we can sort of normalize that behavior, um, and then meeting those needs, because realistically. Um, and this is something that we notice a lot in the autistic community, is that um, also formal diagnosis is a real privilege. There are privileges. Um, it might be that it's financially um, not feasible for people to get a formal diagnosis. It may be it's culturally. It may be that, you know, um, for example, for autism, the measures around autism are not culturally sensitive. So, um, you know, things that might... Um, uh, it works for mostly uh, white men um, <laughs> and white boys, really. Um, and so, um, you know, there may be, you know, access to knowledgeable clinicians, all of those things may actually impact on whether someone's been able to get a formal diagnosis and, of course, whether they want one or not. That doesn't mean that their needs aren't legitimate and don't need to be met. Um, so I think we have to move away from the idea that people need like a piece of paper um, and, and, you know, legally um, protected rights to have accommodations. And we just need to move, move to that place where um, every person has the right to have their accessibility needs met, whether or not there is a formal diagnosis, in which case then if we kind of take that position, then it doesn't really matter whether that student, whether that student has disclosed. If you see needs that need to be met, then you meet those needs, um, regardless of what, you know, um, whether they have a piece of paper or they've disclosed or not. So if you see unmet needs and you see someone who needs um there you know some some elements of accessibility or accommodations in the way that you're they're accessing your classroom then you meet those needs regardless and i think that's probably um, ideal practice for every as much as it's a lot of work it's ideal practice anyway so my my thought would be you know let's let's um let's just meet the needs of the people that we have um and regardless of of what what um, diagnoses, diagnoses or not they have um, mm. and that way we're not sort of taking on that role of trying to play um, you know um, diagnostician or trying to navigate what can be as I said some culturally some very tricky places to take um, you mm. know our, our, our students if they're not ready for that um, you know or if they have as I said if they've had traumatic experiences in the past that just you know, there is a lot of potential to do harm as well. And I think we have to be really careful of that and tread that very carefully. Mm, yeah. No, it's a great way to approach it as just that everyone has needs and, you know, trying to accommodate all students' needs um, regardless of if they have a diagnosis or they're identifying as um, neurodivergent or not. Echo, I think you spoke a little bit about um, this last week in terms of stigma and how East Asian cultures um, might approach neurodiversity. Would you like to add anything here? Yeah, so if I can or if I suspect that they come from a culture where there might not even be stigma or shame but just a lack of recognition yes. um so throwing out words like neurodiverse the student may actually be like I don't know what that means <laughs> or so essentially um what I just my first thing that I do is I gauge the English level so generally if they're intermediate to advanced I just um try and just gauge how they're coping with Australian culture I'll ask things like oh what do you find difficult or what do you think is different what do you love about Australian culture and so as they start to share their experience I can start if if there are any challenges I can kind of see what aspects that um, might be challenging for them socially. Yeah, so this, um, so actual labels and diagnosis or anything like that is sort of just at the back of my mind. It's more just trying to approach them individually as specific to them, like what challenges do you find? Um, and also making them comfortable. So if a student says, oh, I find this really difficult about Australian culture or things like that I would say something like yeah I've been here for most of my life and sometimes that's tricky for me too so <laughs> so kind of reassuring them so it's like a, a several stat strategies at once kind of thing yeah 
Okay. Um, I can see in the chat that Danny's asked if a student needs to be formally diagnosed in order for us to make accommodations, um, so academic accommodations, I'm guessing, for them. Um, and, yeah, in ELICOS, it's really up to the policy of the, the college. Um, but I would say that most colleges aren't um, requiring a formal diagnosis to be able to make any accommodations for these students. And, Luz, um, I see that you answered that question in the chat as well. Oh, yes, I did. There's also, I'll just put in the link, um, but... Um... Uh, there are many assessments done like um IELTS and a few other Cambridge mm. tests and things like that and um the Cambridge website actually has um some adjustments there that mm. you can do to these tests um and I'll just post it um in a second just in the chat um there's all different kinds of things that you can do you can do to um modify those tests um yep. and it's even on their website so it's 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 really okay um there's for um uh, people with dyslexia mainly dysgraphia um there's um time ones as well because i know for universities sometimes you do need to have um the diagnosis to hmm. be able to access those like extra time and things like that definitely for schools um so um yeah, so that 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 one's a bit tricky. Um, if they don't have one, I I I suppose. But within the classroom, yeah, that you can do whatever you like. <laughs> I think, and even in in the assessments in your own college as well, you can do what you like as well. Um, yeah, I'll get that link for you. Okay. Um. All right. Well, we'll move on to the next question then. Uh, Louise, I'll address this one to you first. Um, what are some strategies that we can use to support the success and the well-being of neurodivergent students in our classrooms? Okay, here I'm sorry, I was just putting the link in there. I'm a bit no <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. You'll see a bit of my Did you want me to repeat oh, the question? Okay. Um, um sorry, was it strategies or was it Yeah. Something? I jumped in really quickly then, so I will repeat it. Um, can you tell us um, about some strategies we can use to support the success and the well-being of neurodivergent students in our classrooms? Uh, yes, okay. So um, yeah, so based on what um, we were talking about before, whether students have a diagnosis or not, yeah. um, what we do, like um, what I do at work is we basically um, ask the students themselves because we might see that they might be having um, extra difficulty not just with the language itself but with other things like um, participating or, or whatever it might be even um, reading out questions or um, anything that might um, that you might think oh there might be some sort of learning need here yeah. etc and so it's always a good idea what we do is just basically to ask the students I mean we're not going to ask them like you know what's wrong <laughs> or anything like that or anything about their diagnosis or anything like that mm -hmm. but like you know we just got like oh I've noticed that um this seems like uh, a bit of a difficult task or um yeah. I saw that this happened while you were doing this and so we we do talk to our students a bit like that and and, and they're the best ones to think they, they know better what they need and I think that's one of the you know one of the things that you can do to start off with is just basically mm -hmm. asking them you know um what can I do what can I do for you um and this um yeah so um of course this is not to be done in a in front of the whole class or anything like that I I know that is very different in adults I, I think that uh, English teachers would never do that but it's happened in schools and I'm always like no don't uh so that's why I'm saying it sorry so yes in, in high school it does it's just well and ask the student and I'm like no 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 uh so um so of course in a way that is not singling them out or anything like that I don't think I have to say that to you but anyway uh, that's the best we do we do is just ask the person uh because yeah they have the lived experience 
Um, but yeah, there's some general strategies that you can use to support. Um, so for example, we usually have a meeting with the with the person, with the student, and in, in my case, with the parents. Uh, we ask them what they need and um, set up a few goals that they have. And we, yeah, we base it mostly on strengths and start with that. Um, mm -hmm. So if I start with um, basic, basing it on strengths, I, I, I focus on whether they are better at say speaking or um so then i know what activities or what things to um maybe support the person with uh, not support but help them more in class so if uh, if i see that a student is say for example better at speaking but writing seems to be a bit of an issue um i would focus more on the positive things because um, even though they do need to write, uh, they might be able to do that uh, when they have more time, maybe when they go home, uh, rather than um, doing it in class where it's just kind of dragging out and it's taking too long and I can't do it, um, then they might be able to do it in a different form, a different presentation. So um, if I have a task of, uh, I don't know, I need to write about myself, a, a little biography of myself, 100 words, um, and if for one student, it's easier to be able to um, say it, for another one might be easier to record a video of themselves doing it in another room, or it might be easier to write it, or it might be easier to do a dictation um, through um, Word or whatever. Um, dictations are great, um, digital dictations. Oh, I can't remember the exact word of it. Um, speech to text yeah <laughs> that's the one <laughs> and so so I, I try and find different forms uh or ways that people can present one thing yeah and then if you if you make that sort of like a, a norm all the time for the whole class mm -hmm. then you don't need to be like oh I have to you know modify for this person or I can just give them choice and there's all, all the things that we can do today uh, we're going to focus on these things and then you'll see people thrive and when you see that you you'll you'll feel that they will feel more confident and and, and happier to be able to do those things um i think um so if i you know if i have a student that he can't write because he's dyslexic it's really really hard uh and i give him you know writing all the time well you know I'm not going to be helping him really much with his well-being am I <laughs> so yeah so I'll just give you this little extra homework to do at home with a bit of writing because yeah I guess you do have to practice but there's so many other ways that you can do it you know um uh, a lot of people don't really like it but I love edge edge is is um, Microsoft edge it's great yeah. you can um you can uh, voice record but not just voice record but it's got the reading out loud one um, for people with dyslexia so you can just have it read to you and also highlight it which is very helpful uh, so my students tell me I'm not dyslexic but yeah so it's 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 little things like that that I can do to modify and when you have in the English classroom um, all this set up from the beginning then it, it makes it easier for everyone to access that and yeah um, that's uh, in terms of asking the person what they need, right? Um, in terms of instructions, um, like I said last time, it's important to always have them visually. Uh, I mean, of course, that's not possible all the time because we move on from one activity to the next, but it's a good idea to have them somewhere or even have um, the students even write them out themselves, those that that would like to write them out themselves mm. and, and and put them around in the classroom. I mean, we used to do a lot of that um, kind of thing in the ESL classroom. Once you write them yourselves, you remember them. Um, and those who don't, well, they can see them, the other people who wrote them. Um, so that's another thing. Um, yeah, and then, um, uh, like I said about expectations last time, I'm just, ex just have a different variety of, different modes that you can present work, that students can present work. There's lots of, um, I mean, Google Classroom has it, but there's one called Mirror, M-I-R-O-R, and you can display it on your screen. And um, and for students who don't really like to speak out or speak in front of the whole class, they can, they can type in their answers and then it comes up on the board, on your board, if you're doing like a brainstorm kind of thing or, so that that's also a um, helpful thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, the expectations bit, of course, yes, you know, uh, 
a lot of the things that we say it's it's we don't mean to do it um to exclude anybody but something like uh oh, just imagine this and uh imagine this situation or whatever it's 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 a funny one for me because um i have something called aphantasia as well which means i can't actually picture anything in my head mm -hmm. um so uh, i can't see things in my head um so that apple that you can picture in your head most people um i can't do that so so that's an interesting one as well when you're when you're speaking just be very mindful of yeah your language and things like that um yeah. <laughs> um those yeah thank you though I mean really useful strategies and I love that idea of um focusing on students strengths as the sort of first step um and you know basing a lot of the support around those strengths um for that student who is dyslexic that um, does have to sometimes do a writing task, like you mentioned. Um, I think you said that it would be um, better for this student to be able to do that at home with more time. Um, are there any tools that could help that student or is there any sort of extra support you would recommend to that student when they were doing that at a home? Um, yeah, so, the, um, so almost all kind of PDFs um, or anything that you can yeah, open up in an Edge one, Edge um, Microsoft. It, they it can read it out loud for you. So I think that that's reading it, reading it, and seeing it helps both putting those together, yeah. and then writing it um with um speech to text um speech to text yeah it can it can help you write it and then you can correct it like you can edit it. So some of my students do that um, mm. because it's a lot easier for them to to be able to write then to have like a scribe for example like I know some people do have a scribe for test and things like that but um but it, for a lot of us it's really hard to get somebody else to write it for you because our ideas are flowing so speech to text is amazing it's yeah. it's really good okay great um Luz there is a question for you in the chat yes, just about Claire, the text you I mentioned yes, um, Claire, I'll, no, let, I know Claire. <laughs> I'll let you answer um, that um, yes that's the one Yes, that's the one. Miro? Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Sorry about M I R O R. It's M I R O. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I know Miro. Yeah. Great. Um, Echo, uh, do you have any other suggestions for strategies to support students in the classroom? I saw you nodding um, away enthusiastically. Yeah. No, <laughs> I I actually this is the first time I've heard of an a fantasia that Luz oh, yeah. was mentioning. So I'm actually planning to do some research about that. Peter, yes. I think, I put the link in there. So, oh, yeah, yeah cause I, <laughs> yeah. Um, because one of the tricky things about adult education in my um, college, at least, is that due to confidentiality and uh, privacy, we can't ask the parents. We can't know until the student is willing to share. And often, in many cases, the student in my experience, they have an idea that they have challenges in some area, but they can't articulate exactly what it is as well. So articulation and expression, I often find with students um, is something that they find challenging as well. So sometimes if I want to clarify exactly what it is that they're having difficulty, what is causing them distress, it's very important you ask the right questions like simple yes or no questions usually work the best because once things get convoluted or abstract, you've lost them. So you just simply ask yes, no, yes, no, and you start to gather what it put. And then you ask them, could it be this? Does it sound close to this? Mm -hmm. So no. Um, so, yeah, so because I've often found students can get very frustrated um, or that they, they may have a lot of anxiety. I particularly deal with students um, sometimes on humanitarian visas, so their refugee status. And so, you know, things that have happened globally have affected them. So um, keep it simple and, yeah, um, and reassure them. And so for me, yeah, so yes or no questions really help. And then I will say, could it be this? Could it be that? Um, and that seems to help with their well-being in my experience. Yeah. <laughs> And when, when you're offering those suggestions, would that be um, 
for example, you know, different types of supports that you would be saying, would this be helpful or would that be helpful? Is that the sort of thing you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. so everything. So I would say, so when, mm. so I would say, um, like, for example, like Luz was mentioning about the aphantasia, I would say, do you have difficulty imagining this? Yes mm. or no? Um, maybe if I do this and draw a picture on the board, would that help you a bit more? Yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 that's great because it's a language barrier as well, Echo. So yeah. I think that's a that's a really good way. But for a lot of us that have, um, quite um difficulty sometimes with overwhelm. So when things are very overwhelming, and we're finding it hard to breathe, and um, we're having a bit of a meltdown or a shutdown as well. Sorry, I'm throwing lots of words out there that you might not know, but happy to answer them later. Um. Mm -hmm then it is very important that people don't ask me, are you okay? <laughs> and, um, and, and, and to, and to, and to do those questions are really good. Actually, um, one of my students did a great presentation on, um, on autism once, um, she's autistic herself and she was amazing. And she was saying like, don't ask open, open questions because I don't have the energy or the brain power in that moment to answer your questions and it's not that I'm being rude it's not that I'm being um difficult it's just that I really can't do it so um so she was saying the same thing just use yes no questions or whatever something that I do that I don't know I don't know if it works with some adults it might seem a bit maybe too I don't know but like with the kids I sometimes uh, write it down Mm -hmm. this, do you want me to sit next to you or do you want me to go away and um and so they'll say yes or no and actually it works all the time that as soon as they they look at that I'm writing it they just look at me and go like and and they just want me to sit next to them and just not talk to them sometimes that's but it, yeah it's a really thing. good reminder I think because we often assume that you know by sitting with someone it would be helpful mm -hmm. um or, you know, by asking them if I, if they're okay, then that is supportive. But, um, you know, obviously not in all cases is that actually, are they helpful behaviors? Yeah. So it's a and, good and, and, and I think awareness that, for us to have. Yeah, I think one of the hardest things for adults is that we, like, you know, all of this is happening so soon with, you know, the neurodiversity movements and identity and pride and, and all this it's 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 happening so quick you know um that it it it's really hard for adults because some adults might not know like i didn't know i had aphantasia until a few years ago maybe even two years ago not not even um because i was reading about it and studying and all that in my studies and um and I was like, what? I thought this was everybody. <laughs> I thought everyone was the same. And then I started asking people and uh, and people were like, no, 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 that's actually, um, that's actually not normal. <laughs> or whatever, I don't like to use the word, but yeah. So, so a lot of us are still like not, not knowing why we react certain ways or why we do the things that we do. Not everybody has that um, awareness of themselves uh, and and you might just go like oh wow that person went undiagnosed all their lives and um mm -hmm. you know eh, not that you need to be diagnosed but you know like they didn't know like we have less awareness uh we had less awareness when we were growing up than than people now uh, yeah. you know like I tell my kids oh man you know now it's amazing it's amazing because you have so much power and you're empowered to do so much yeah so yeah yeah. yeah and Can i think I just, oh, sorry <laughs> i was just going to say the sensory issues that i was going to that that not being diagnosed um mm -hmm. or not knowing at a younger age um with um with um sensitivities and sensory differences it's really hard because not all of us know why we were why we react or or why we're so tired why we can't do something why we're exhausted why you know so many things and it, it could be just that it could be so many sensory issues that we have and of course in the classroom everything is so loud you know sometimes we might need it would be a good idea for colleges to have like um a room where people might go and sort of just go for a little walk or 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 take a little break a little sensory yes. break where you could just you know go sometimes you need days <laughs> five minutes is not going to cut it uh but um 
things like that that will help you sort of um, feel a little bit um, in control, I guess, that you can step out for a minute, come back yeah, in. Because Ellicott's classes are busy places, you know. We try to make yeah. them dynamic and we do try to yeah. mix up activities and move on from one thing to the next thing, you know. Yes, and it's so fast. And, and you don't get bored. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so you don't get bored. And a lot of people are, are quite fine with it. it. It's just that thing we have to be like, you know, that person might just be sitting in the corner just sort of taking it all in <laughs> and just waiting. And, and they're fine. Sometimes I'm... I'm listening, engaging my brain, but I'm not physically engaging, which means, you know, we might show it differently. So, mm. Mm. yeah. Okay. I'd like to circle back around now to um, the common adjustments that neurodivergent students can get um, when they complete assessment tasks and exams. So I know we spoke a little bit about this before and Luz, you recommended having a look at the Cambridge exams website because they have a good list of adjustments that can be used. Um, in your experience, uh, we'll start with you, Echo, this time, what kinds of adjustments are given um, where you work for students who are neurodiverse? Um, so firstly, we take care of the environment. So I work at a college that's highly flexible and yes. very um, good with adjustments. And I do know that a lot of teachers don't get that opportunity. So I am aware that we are restricted by the policy or the structure of, of the institution that you work at. But with me, I work in a place where I will mention you know, for example, I think this student is sensory sensitive um, and I think that we need to have special provisions and that they've always been very willing to change the physical environment if necessary. Um, and what's really has been a really amazing experience for me is that how accepting other students are and how easily they normalize things. So um, for example, if I tell students, okay, so we have to close the blinds a little bit because it's a bit bright today. And, and usually I don't mention it's because of the student. I usually actually say, I like things a little bit darker because <laughs> like I'm the teacher. So they're like, oh, I'm the teacher, that's what she wants. Um, and then after a while, the students just adapt. Generally, they don't ask questions. They just, they will accept. Um, and if the student has something loud on their phone or something, I'll be like, um, uh, can you please turn it down? And they're very willing to do that. Um, so physical things are very important, I think, particularly for students who are sensory sensitive. Um, I think Luz also mentioned speech to text is amazing. <laughs> Honestly, um, so with some students, that, that writing seems to be the biggest challenge, then the most common challenge for neurodiverse students. In my experience, that their amazing self awareness, amazing social intelligence, really just compassionate, empathetic. But writing, um, you can tell that they have a big challenges. So I always give them the option, um, do you want to do like speech to text or did you want to record it? We record things so they can speak and we can record the assessment. So we allow them that option as well. Fully understand those. Sometimes these, this kind of flexibility may not be an option for Because I think in, S, in ESL writing is part of the academic requirement. You have to have a certain mm -hmm. level level of acad writing academia so I do understand um, but that's maybe something that we can all talk about <laughs> and strategize about <laughs> and find some answers <laughs> yeah yeah that's a, that's a really really difficult one because yeah I don't know if that's ever going to change to be honest because um, <laughs> I mean as I see it there's just so like technology is so helpful that I don't see that we still have to you know do that. like honestly but you know like I mean yeah I don't know I mean we have some people that may not have any I mean I don't know any learning challenges and they still struggle to write an email but get help from AI why is that okay and why not modifying things for our students not okay you know it's just a bit like is it ever going to change kind of thing it's a good point, though, isn't it? Because, yeah, obviously with, with AI and ChatGPT, um, that, that would be an extremely helpful tool for, for someone who who doesn't like writing. Um, and so I guess, 
yeah, you know, we um, a couple of weeks ago ran a fascinating session with some of the education leads at three major universities and um, all three of the universities were incorporating the use of um, AI tools into uh, their assessments um, and uh, all three of them were kind of downplaying the um, importance of uh students written language proficiency um, for their degrees so it will be really interesting to see where we land on that one in terms of uh, writing and how um, much students need to develop their writing to be able to enter a, a higher education degree for example. Mm. Okay um, so if we think about activities that we use in English language classrooms. Uh, I think we were talking a little bit before about how um, Ellicott's classrooms can be really loud and um, energetic and uh, obviously with the communicative approach, there's a lot going on. You might need to change partners or swap desks and move around and things like that. Um, so... Are there any examples of how we can adjust activities in our classes um, that you might be able to share with us? Luz, for example, I know you used to work in Ellicos. Um, Can you think of any examples of how a typical activity might be able to be adjusted to be more inclusive? Um, yeah, so... Um... When we're thinking about sensory and yeah, the classrooms are just definitely not very sensory for, um, friendly for a lot of us, but you know, there's, it's really hard to change it. Um, but you, there are a few things that you might be able to do from the get go. Uh, one thing that I've, I've, I've seen some teachers do is um, have like quiet music when everyone, or like nice, classical music or some kind of very nice um I don't know nature anxiety reducing so all sorts of kind uh, at the moment in Spotify that you can find um while students are taking a break so yeah having breaks in between those activities so so we'll have a full-on activity and then we'll move on to like okay we're gonna have a bit of a of a brain break as a whole class and so everyone's having those breaks. Everyone's yes. taking it easy. Oh, we're turning the lights off. Um, we're, you know, the lights, I, I, the light thing is a bit of, it, it's difficult because it depends on the classroom. If you have a very dark classroom, then turning the lights off might not be great for everyone. And some people might be like, oh, I can't see in here. And we do have, we do actually have a lot of neurodivergent people who like the lights. Uh, they, I had this one student once and um, we moved to another classroom just next door because um he found it a bit overwhelming where we were and so we did and we have like a glass window a glass door and uh, we sat in there the first thing I did was turn the lights off and then he got up and turned them on <laughs> and he's like I need the light and I, he was just like quite like I really need it and I was like yeah okay <laughs> so <laughs> I had to turn it on and leave it on for a bit so but anyway, I don't think a lot of people enjoy those really bright white lights over desks, over white desks. It's the worst. And um, so, yeah, so lights off, a little bit of music, having those brain breaks every now and then in between activities. I know that the class uh, class time is really important, especially in the ESL room, classroom. But if you could try and put those in between your activities, that would be great. Have, you know, quiet activities and loud activities if you got like a, a find someone who then maybe we can come back to um gathering that own information and creating a graph or something about who likes this who likes that whatever you want to do or whatever you're doing in class um and some people might do it on their laptop some people might do it on paper some people might do it on the mirror app or whatever other apps there are mm -hmm. um so but if you're taking you know after that okay, we're going to take this break, we just have a little bit of music, you could go around and, and actually interact more one on one with the students, because sometimes we don't get that. We're just uh. like, you know, that was chickens in there trying to do our best. Uh, so you also get that, you know, that, that bit of a break. <laughs> um, another thing that I like to do is um, 
just put in a little bit of, uh, or just normalize, sorry, a bit of standing and walking around. But we did do that a lot in the EFL, if the EFL classroom, I think. So standing up and walking around make that very normal to do because people do need those breaks in the classroom to move around. It, it, mm. it works a lot. It helps. And, and find out what your students really like because sometimes you might find that they're not able to do a task, not that they're not able, they, they, they find it really challenging to do a task, uh, a writing task that maybe if it's about a topic that they're really passionate about they might actually be do it it's not that they're able it's just that your your initiative your whole regulation when you are doing something that you like changes so much like I would not be able to be to speak to people I don't know how many people are there in here 68 people <laughs> uh like this if it wasn't something I was passionate about um you would probably ask me a different question and I would just stare at you and not talk. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, if you, if you do that, you find out what your students really like. That's, yeah. Um, yeah. I know we spoke last week about sort of adjusting our approach to setting tasks and topics and things yeah. like that. A another thing that you might want to do is have lots of fidget toys in your classroom. They don't all work mm. for everyone. Everyone has a different um, sensory need like tactile or smell don't do smells <laughs> not not in the class unless you know no. everybody likes it that's another one that kills me so yes. if you have like fidget toys and things like that that you know people can look at or or a lamp so whatever they're, they're very helpful for for a lot of people a bit of mindfulness mm -hmm. but I, I understand in the classroom it's really hard to do that mm -hmm. Um, sunglasses. There's some great suggestions, and these are all things that I know my daughter, who's in primary school, these things happen in her classroom. So, yeah, yes, yes, she's always yes. talking about them. Yeah, and we also reduce homework and 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 reduce work that isn't isn't needed. Needed because the homework is not about like so. For example, my son has the choice to do it or not do it. Yeah but he knows it's there, it's a rule, it comes from school. So he stresses about having to do his homework. And, and but then it's a very, very stressful situation, but he doesn't not want, not, not want to do it. He wants to do it. So the rule is there, this is the homework and it comes from the teacher, it comes from, so it's very important. So sometimes give work only to those that ask for it. Uh, you know what I mean? Because like we literally have to change the prep for we call it prep homework for some of our students and <laughs> make it look like nobody else has had this like reduce it so much because the stress and the anxiety for these students is really hard um so we we, we reduce it significantly uh, to the point sometimes that we say please don't give the student any homework so mm -hmm. that makes it also yeah really really hard and i know they need to practice but um yeah that's like their choice but it's also a well-being thing too so that's that's a bit tricky yeah yeah it makes sense um there is a question in the chat which if a few people are saying they found really interesting it's a great one from tanya um she just said sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a need or just a behavior that um could be inappropriate you know for example she said um if someone needs to be on the phone due to sensory issues compared to them just wanting to be chatty with friends. Um, so how can we tell the difference? Um, mm, I'm not sure I've heard of a sensory issue of being on the phone. I think that's just an example. But um, okay, can you, sorry, you need to explain that to me. I <laughs> guess it's like, you know, if you're in the classroom and you're thinking, you know, this person is is doing something that's distracting everyone and it's it, it feels inappropriate. Um, how would we sort of instead of judging that as as inappropriate behavior or you know bad behavior that we need to you know manage how would we tell the difference between that and then um something that is a sensory issue that needs to be supported in the classroom mel do you want to jump in there yeah sorry echo um no, no, go ahead <laughs> Fundamentally, one of the easiest ways that you can tell is when you, um, you know, perhaps say, you know, um, you know, let's put our phones away, the level of distress that someone has in, in doing that, how difficult is it for, like, if you say, okay, well, we're not doing phones, you know, we, we don't generally do phones in the classroom, let's say, and as, as, as Lou said, <laughs> I'm not sure, but let's say you're using your phone to listen to some music to try and drown out other you know, um, sounds, 
because it's too noisy and someone else is talking to their, to, you know, and you say, okay, well, we're, we're putting phones away now so that we can concentrate on our work or however you do it when you're talking to adults and you're not talking to like 12 year olds, which is <laughs> where I am pitch. Um, and somebody goes, oh, yeah, okay, fine. And puts their phone away. And there is no distress attached to that. There is no, there might be frustration. There might be, you know, like I don't want to, but there's no distress. If you see someone is distressed by that, then usually that's a really good indicator that it was more of a need. So you you might not know until you actually do a little bit of experimentation around that. So, um, you know, or, um, you know, if there's things that are um, interfering with other people's learning, you know, it's about maybe um, supporting people to understand, you know, or, or you know, and, and it, it goes back, we talked last year, last week, a lot about the relational kind of aspect and the care aspect, because, you know, teaching is a care profession. So, you know, coming to this with that caring kind of interface of, so what do you need? You know, um, you looked very upset when you had to put your phone away. What was, what were you using it for? What did you need it for? What can, is there a different way that we can um, provide that for you? Um, and, and having that kind of, that default position to caring about what that looks like in people's experiences, I think is really going to be really important. So it, it's not necessarily that it's easy always, um, you know, um, but it's also you notice patterns. So if you notice that that person is always wearing headphones and always on their phone when they come into the classroom and finding it really, really difficult, it's very different than the person who ad hocly kind of takes a phone call in the middle of a class. So you'll be able to, it's about that that caring kind of, you know, connection with the people in your classroom or you see people flinching at a particular kind of response and you go, well, okay, there's more here than just, um, uh, you know, um, I, I don't like, this is not what I'd like to do. Cause I mean, obviously we all have our likes um, yeah. um, and this is stretching towards the needs rather than the likes. So I think that that's a really um, um, important thing just to actually, you know, take note of how people are reacting and how in, intense their reactions are. And sometimes people won't show that on their face and sometimes you won't see it at all. But if, you know, if you know that that person wasn't say talking on the phone, you might afterwards go and say, well, you you know, is there a different way that so that, you know, that we can give you music or is there what we, you, you know, I, I'm really interested to know what you were doing on your phone. So it's that connecting piece to, that will allow you to sort of understand. So there's a bit of trial error and error, I suppose, is what I wanted to say. It's not it's not going to be a there isn't a recipe here that you can say, well, you know, this is or isn't a thing. So it, it will take some detective work um, on, on your part. Um, I don't know if that's what you were going to say, Echo, or something completely different. Um, I actually have an actual example I was just going to share because I do have a student in my class currently who um, needs a screen in front of him as in like it's a need. Yeah. Um, I think he just finds it soothing. And, and so initially um, I tested him <laughs> like um, like Melanie said, I was a bit of a detective. And so just in class, just randomly, I will ask him a question um, about what we're studying or what we're learning and he will answer very quickly. So clearly he is focused. <laughs> so he, he he's clearly focused. He just needs for soothing. So that's how I found out, okay, so this student, this is a need and it actually helps him work better mm -hmm. um, and rather than being distracted. So I just wanted to give that example. Yeah, no, no, great. Yeah, really, really fantastic answers, you know, around that sort of bit of detective work in the classroom, which is what, what we do as teachers, you know, to discover, discover people's needs as well. Um, there was another question in the chat just around ADHD. Um, so I think we've we've spoken a lot about different uh, supports or ways we can make our classrooms more inclusive, but somebody wanted uh, some specific advice for around students with ADHD. Um, do any of the panellists want to jump in and talk to that one? Oh, what sorry, was what was the question? I was going to say, what was the, do, do you know what the actual, what what, what we were um uh ask <laughs> yeah i'll go back to the question now a lot of what is being recommended for autism here would apply to adhd students too that one um so the question was actually a little bit further up okay mm -hmm. <laughs> i'll jump in oh now. okay no i totally missed it sorry um so uh, i 
I, I do oh, neurodivergence have... includes students yes, with ADHD. Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. Um, well, um, um, I think it was oh, just a, no, a general question around support for students, specifically with so, ADHD. I, I, I don't think oh, that oh, is... Oh. Um, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I was saying I was speaking more from my experience, but I think that they they really do co coexist and they're very similar. But Mel, you probably want to jump in that one. I, I was just going to say, um, what we know about ADHD is that people with ADHD have si often have similar sensory needs. So there is an overlap in sensory. So what we've been talking about with sensory needs is often yeah. the same. So those yeah. things are best practice for usually for everyone, like having a low sensory stimuli environment so that your brain can focus on learning is best practice for everyone, full stop. Mm -hmm. um, it's a need, and, and this is where we go back to our needs and wants. You know, it's it's, a, it's more of a need the more neurodivergent you get. But ADHD is, certainly has a sensory um, component. Yeah. One of the things um, about ADHD, um, and, you know, I have um, someone who calls it their Jaguar brain, their Zoomy Jaguar brain, um, and um, someone who calls it their shiny new thing brain. Um, and, you know, it's a the dopamine seeking so it's a dopamine seeking thing you know you're looking for the ne the next hit of dopamine of learning something new so what you can absolutely be guaranteed about if you have ADHD students is that repetitive rote learning will turn them off in a way that you can not not understanding how how um, tedious and difficult that will, if, if not impossible, it will be because there's no dopamine involved in rote learning and doing the same thing over and over again um, and in routine learning. So the more uh, creativity and new stuff and the way you can create new learning um, and new dopamine hits for um, our ADHDers is, is that that's what we're looking for. We're looking for those short hits of, bursts of learning so you can repeat learning but it has to be different it can be the same in terms of like a learning goal but you have to have new things because as soon as you have repetition you have turn off so that's the your biggest teaching strategy with ADHD is creativity flexibility moving keeping on the go right and then one of the things that I'd love you know that I use a lot in my own family and I use a lot with other people and I know Liz will have um, heard me say this lots of times and it's great for people who are ADHD, who are autistic, but for completely different reasons, is the question, what will finish look like for you today? What does it look like when you finish this task? Because for autistic people, um, many of us are, I think I said last week, monotropic, we've got that kind of um, our, our brain tentacles wrap around this thing and we can't let go until we've finished whatever it is that we're on. So finish for us might be quite an involved kind of process. So in order to be finished today, I need to have finished and edited this paragraph. I need to have done this. This is what it looks like when I feel like I can finish and transition away from this today. Yeah. But for someone with ADHD, finish might look like, I wrote three words and I concentrated for like 15 minutes and I'm done. Like I, I, I've done it. I've, that, that's finished. That's like you asked me for a sentence and I gave you three words. That's finished for me, right? Yes. So, um, And being able to understand what it is that the person in front of you feels like they need to produce for you in this context today of what you've asked them to do. So your task might be whatever, you know, write on or speak about or whatever. Um, what does that look like for you to feel that you're done and ready to move on? Because that that moment, as soon as your ADHD feels that they're finished, they've turned off. They're looking for their new dopamine hit, right? Um, and as soon as if you try and drag your autistic person away without having finished, they're not going to be able to transition. We're going to be stuck with our octopus tentacles around that thing until we're finished. Which means that as teachers, we have to be extraordinarily flexible. Um, you know, I often say we have to be elastic girl, you know, like from The Incredibles, you know, we have to be able to, to contort ourselves into all sorts of ways in order to be able to, um, to basically accommodate both of those things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your ADHD is going to finish very quickly and be ready for the next thing. Your autistic person may or may not. And the joy comes when you have an autistic ADHD, of which there are many of us. <laughs> And they have different parts of their brain compete. And so what that might look like on one day could be very different than what it might look like on another day. So it's always worth asking the question, like, what's it going to look like for you today? What, it, what, what will finish look like for you today? What do you need to get done to be able to move on from where from, from this task? 
Or when do I need to give you a new do dopamine hit? When are you going to be to feel like you've done enough that you need a new dopamine hit? And and I think that that's a really it's a it's such a hard thing, but it's where I'm sorry I, I realized that I was extremely animated and excited through that discussion. Probably didn't need that much animation, but no, it was great. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's that kind of um, so if you think about you know. Um, and this is kind of it. So the sensory stuff is probably the same, but if you think about your um, ADHD brains as jaguars who are going to be zooming from here to there, doing everything as quickly as possible, needing lots and lots of input and lots and lots of new stuff, mm -hmm. and your autistic brains being autistic uh, octopuses wrapping their tentacles around everything as tight and holding them as tightly as they can and trying to accommodate both of those things, <laughs> you, you might be, um, you might, you might get to a kind of a, an inclusive classroom maybe a little bit. Yeah. No, it is really helpful because, I mean, I guess if um, someone with ADHD did tell you their idea of finished was three sentences, but the expectation was a lot longer than that, then as a teacher, would you come back and say, well, can you do another three sentences that include this or um, would you, would you rejig the expectation? Maybe. And Deborah's just made a really good point. And this is um, ADHD people can, if they're interested in something, have huge periods of hyper focus yeah. where they're just completely deep dive and really, really hyper focused. So if there is something that you need an output that is, um, you know, a paragraph and the, the three words isn't going to be enough, then yeah. probably the expectation is not around what the output is but around what that's going to what is going to provide you with the level of interest that you need in order to be able to do yes that okay. task yeah. um so it may not be as much you know so and this is this is true for autistic people as well um, mm -hmm. and again a lot of these neurodivergent kind of tendencies are very similar um I, autistic people and adhd people both of both of us we, we don't we want to know why we want to know what the justification for us learning if it's meaningless and tedious is it have where how is it relevant to our lived experience and to our lives yeah. where does it play into our you know our deep passions and our interests and so um so thank you deborah that was a great um reminder that you know we it may not be okay well if you're only able to get me three words on this particular thing where what could you the question yes. might be so yeah. i need this is what finish will look like today for you this is what i need so what are you going to do it on that you're going to be out you know how are you going to frame that so that you can actually get that done and and get that hyper focus so um you know um and and you know if 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 that hyper focus is there then and you've got somebody starting uh you know and regardless and you've got someone on that task and they're really involved it's going to be very hard to transition them off so that, again that's that flexibility to make sure that you know people are able to be supported to transition when they're ready rather than because you've got a predetermined time of well you've been given 45 minutes to do this so therefore you must be finished because that's not how our brains generally work yeah yeah just a really good reminder of just that really flexible approach um in classrooms for teachers Echo, um, we, we've, we've got one minute, but I, saw, I did see you getting really excited about this as well. Did you want to add anything? <laughs> no, I just found what Melanie was saying so helpful. Um, yes, absolutely. Even though I haven't been diagnosed with either ADHD or autism, I can even like neurotypical people, I'm sure could also relate when we fixate or we hyper fixate on something on this day for whatever particular reason. Yeah. Um, and so even as a, a teacher, I like I think another thing is we as teachers for me personally is I think we have to be mindful of what emotional state we are in yes. um I know it sounds like there are so many passionate teachers <laughs> from the chats and, and listening to Melanie and everyone and Luz um but I think that I think to be self-aware of our emotional state and our well-being as well and how it can filter or affect how we teach I think is important and um, affect our flexibility and things like that so just I was just reflecting on myself as a teacher of how I would accommodate to the students as well as being aware of where I am emotionally in that classroom as well yeah. great um, point yeah because yeah. there's you know a lot going on for teachers isn't there and yeah. um, with, with flexibility I think you know it, it, it asks a lot of us so yeah it is good to check in with ourselves as well yeah <laughs> Um, all right, well, we'll finish up there. Um, it's been 
a fantastic uh, two sessions with the three of you. Thank you so much. Um, spoke to a few people after the first session last week who just said that you all touched on points that were new to them um, in this space that they'd found really helpful um, and they were really excited to come along to the second session. So thank you. Um, we really appreciate your support in sharing your, your ideas and um experiences on this topic with our Ellicost community. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you also to everybody for coming along and for all your generosity in the chat too. See you later. Thanks everyone. Have a lovely Bye afternoon. Everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Nice to meet you, Echo. <laughs> I'll see you nice again, Mel. Bye. <laughs> Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye. It was lovely to work with you all. Bye, Bye. <laughs> See you.